Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast and the Finding Genius Foundation. Um, as mentioned, in regards to the foundation, we're working on a project to help people that suffer from anxiety and depression. And one of the things that we're doing is we're asking brave souls to come on that have dealt and deal with anxiety and depression and talk about it. Some want to be anonymous. Some are willing to give their name. And I really appreciate them all because it's not an easy thing. So today, my guest is willing to talk about it. Uh, her name is Holly Barker. I've had her on before. Uh, she does cancer research. But again, she was brave and open enough to talk about her personal struggles with anxiety and depression. So Holly, thanks so much for coming back. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me, Richard. Yeah, if you would tell me, what, when did you first start experiencing you know, anxiety or depression or stress? You know, what, what was it like in the past? Yeah, I would say I've had multiple different uh, manifestations of yeah anxiety and depression from as early as my teenage years I would think it probably I yeah I wasn't aware of it I, it has been in the family so perhaps other people were noticing it but I didn't know that was what was wrong until about when I was 20 I guess I really <laughs> had a big depressive episode and that's when I started to see a psychologist and um, start to talk about it and start to do some sort of therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that. Well, before you knew what it was, what did it feel like and what did you think it was? Yeah, I just knew that I had trouble sometimes. I had times when I couldn't do anything. I would just have to go into my room and I had trouble with social situations and just I couldn't I was just not feeling right I just didn't feel happy and I didn't know what the problem was yeah I didn't know it was something that I could fix I think I don't know it's, it was really weird it, before I actually started seeing a psychologist it was I just had no idea that was wrong, that I had this thing wrong with me that well you know this thing part of part of my personality well you, yeah, you said so, that around 20 you had a major depressive episode what happened there and, and did you recognize it yourself at that point or it was only after you went to a psychologist that you realized, oh, my God, I had depression. Yes, yeah, so I think I was it was when I was saying I was sort of in my room a lot and I was crying a lot. I was crying all the time and I couldn't stop crying. And I didn't there was didn't seem to be any reason for me crying. I was just crying. And my partner at the time, I think I'd been seeing him for probably three or four years, but he, you know, we're both young. And so he didn't really know. Um, what was going on with me or what to do. So yeah, I think my family um, finally got me uh, to see a psychologist and I started having, even then though, it was sort of very thought of as very mild. I think it wasn't until I was about 20, 
four, I think, that I had the really sort of big episode where I just went into my bedroom and went into bed and didn't get up. And I I wasn't actually living at home at that point. And it took a little while for my family to realise that I had stopped. I was doing my PhD at the time and I wasn't going in to do my PhD anymore. And that's very unlike me to just stop going to do, to work, who I called it work. And um, my family found, my mum found me at the share house that I was at and brought me home to stay with them for a while and that's when we finally was diagnosed and started to get on top of things. What were you experiencing at that time? Do you remember? Was it, did you just feel like lethargic or did you feel sad? Like what was going yeah. on? Yeah, yeah. Well, so there were a few things that had happened in my life. So there had been an issue with a another partner that happened to work at the same place where I was doing my PhD and he was actually starting to stalk me and then I just had a lot of things going on in the background maybe issues with friends or whatever so there was a sort of a point at which I couldn't take anymore I think my brain couldn't take anymore and normally I will go for for a run or do some exercise because I know that really helps me to feel better and just like you were saying I couldn't even go for a run I couldn't even run to the end of the street I had absolutely no energy and so that's why I just went back to bed and just stayed in bed and I don't even remember what I was thinking about I you know now I couldn't lie in bed for an hour before getting bored but I just would lie there all day and all night and I think I was sleeping and just sleeping and constantly sleeping and not able to do anything until yeah and so then when I went home to my parents house people were a couple of friends would call and I couldn't speak to them on the phone I would try to get to the phone but I would start crying before I got there so I'd have to go back to my bedroom and then that was when I started seeing well yeah, so I was seeing a psychologist and also a psychiatrist to talk about it, um, taking antidepressants. So that's when the medication sort of part came in. So did you start with CBT and medication at the same time? And, you know, what did you experience the first few weeks with both? Yeah, so I had done a little bit of CBT, so I continued. I think I had a new psychologist at this point and I really got along with her well. And so I was doing CBT with her and that was, I found that really hard work I just couldn't understand why my why I found these sort of things in life really hard and other people didn't have to do CBT and didn't and just got through life seemingly really easily I just thought why am I finding this so hard why am I having to do these spreadsheets to figure out my feelings and work out the appropriate way to respond to things and yeah It was a lot of work, but I think it really did help me to think about things in a healthy way. And as I said, at the same time, I was seeing a psychiatrist, which didn't help at all, but I had to see him to take the medication. They're like drug vending machines. Yeah, but I didn't get along with him at all, really. Didn't find, I don't remember anything that that we talked about. So obviously it didn't help in any way. I didn't feel like it helped at the time, but I was really anti taking any drugs for a long time. I think I put it off, I don't know six weeks or something, but I hadn't really improved. And I knew that this was something that had kept happening in my past. So I finally thought, okay, I will start to take the medication, but it was horrible for about six weeks. So the first week I couldn't sleep. It made me really jittery and wired. I could not sleep. Um, I couldn't do anything. couldn't focus. My brain was going a hundred miles an hour. And then finally, after that first week, I was able to sleep but I didn't, it still didn't feel any better. But the GP had actually said, you know, just wait, it doesn't happen immediately. So about six weeks after I started the medication, it, I started to feel better. I could feel lighter and things were easier and I was able to go back to my PhD and yeah, do normal things again. Well, you said CBT was hard work. Can you give an example of what that means? You know, you don't, it can be as personal or non-personal as you want, but what made it hard? So obviously, well, first of all, I had to find situations that were, that I was struggling to deal with. So that was sort of forcing me to think about things. And then I had to write it down on this sheet of paper and, and, and work through the process of what's a negative way of thinking about this, like my negative thoughts about that that situation. And then what's a more positive way to think about it. So it was just, it was like doing homework, right? You had to sit there and write these sheets of paper out and um yeah like I said I just couldn't understand why I found this stuff so hard people's other people's brains just seem to jump to the positive 
And mine didn't do that. And I had to work myself through things to get to the positive way of seeing or the not negative way of seeing something. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Were you negatively geared before that, or it was when you were like acutely depressed, is that when it became, everything became negative biased? Yeah, I don't think I was, I don't think I'm a particularly negative person before that or, or now at all. So yeah, it was just in that situation. I could not see a good in anything. I was just in a hole, just yeah, in a really bad place. And I actually haven't mm. felt like that again since it hasn't had the depression hasn't been a big issue now. It's just been anxiety that pops up every now and then. So, yeah, it's interesting and whether, and I have been on those antidepressants on and off. I think I had a six year break in the middle where I didn't take anything. And then I've been on them again for the last four years, I guess, but just a low dose. And so whether that's what's preventing me from having these depressive episodes, I don't know, but the anxiety can come back and occasionally, yeah, the social anxiety. What were your relationships like with people? When you were, you know, the first time where it was really strong, you know, were people saying like, what's wrong with you? Were you lashing out at people or were you just avoiding them totally? Like, what was it like in relation with the people? I was avoiding people and I lost a few friends during that time. I had some really close friends. Um, I had a little, I had a little group of friends from university and I mean, I think they were very different to me anyway. They did a very sort of, they ended up, they've ended up in very different careers, but I think I was hoping that they would help. I don't know how I thought they could help, but maybe just show empathy. But I think people really struggle to understand. And I don't know how I was coming across on the outside to these people, but I just thought that they would see how much I was struggling and come and and sit with me or uh, take me out or do something um, and to make me feel like it was okay and that they could support me. But I just felt they carried on with their lives and I was withdrawing from everything. And yeah, I think we just never, it, it, yeah, we just never got past that. And so I'm aware of them, you know, I'd, if I saw them in the street, I'd say hello, but there's no close friendship like there was before like that we were really close back then. So yeah, unfortunately I lost friends during that time. Um, but then. Well, was your, was your family friends. with you? Well, your oh, family yeah, yeah. was a constant throughout that time. So like, have you ever asked them what they experienced? Well, so I saw my, I'm not sure what I, what I can say, actually. I saw close family also go through similar kind of, de- uh, yeah, depressive episodes, I guess, where they had to go to, yeah, therapy, yeah, sort of long-term therapy, like, like a month where you go and stay somewhere and, and work through your issues. So I had seen that happen to close family members. And I think my family dealt with it amazingly. The fact that, you know, they brought me home until I was well again and to go and live on my own again after that. And yeah, they checked on me and, you know, the fact that they had noticed that it was happening in the first place. No, that my family were fantastic. So nothing bad happened with my family over this situation. They, they did everything right for me as far as I'm concerned. No, I'm, I'm not um, saying, yeah. um, I'm glad nothing bad happened, but I mean, I don't know if you want to revisit it or how long ago this was, but just asking them like what were you like during that time you know not that you know again you didn't do anything bad to them and they were there to support you but they might have an insight into your mindset at that time that maybe you don't have because you don't remember it's a long time ago you don't want to remember it's just up to you it's just an idea that they'll, they'll know maybe if you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on itunes 
Yeah, so it is about 20 years ago. And so it is a little bit hazy. And I think it is just hazy. But I would, I have said, I have made comments to my mother since then saying, so and so is really, you know, if somebody else is going through it, and she's aware of it as well, I said, Oh, wow, that person is really struggling. I was never that bad. I know that's, you know, not a not saying that they're bad, just saying that I didn't have it as bad as that. I didn't have that my experience as bad as that. And she said, you were much worse than that. So that was that was really interesting because I was not aware of that. I guess all along, I knew I was really struggling. I knew I was going through an awful thing inside, but I thought I'd kept it. I thought I'd hidden it quite well and obviously hadn't. And it was obviously worse. It was actually as bad as I was feeling inside other people were seeing that I was really struggling as much as that as well but then when yeah yeah it was really eye-opening when she said no you are much worse than how bad that person is struggling at the moment I that was a big surprise yeah I can tell you you know like being around people I know that are depressed sometimes you know it takes a while for all the people that associate with someone that's depressed or anxious or you know anxious um, to learn how to deal with them because initially it just seems like I mean, I was like, what the hell is wrong with this person? Why are they being so nasty to me? Why are they being so this, so pissy? Why are they just get it together? I mean, I could, uh, just being honest, I couldn't help but That's what I thought at various times until I got more of a maturity and an understanding. So if it happened to you when you were young and your friends were in there, let's say the early 20s, they probably wouldn't have the tools to be able to understand. And maybe they, you know, I'm sure they weren't jerks, but maybe they had some of the same reactions. Like, what the hell is wrong with Holly? Why is she do, you know? forget it then I guess I guess yeah, I did some wrong I was just a, I I, yeah I think I was just a difficult person and I mean I didn't think I was I thought I was basic I basically just disappeared and that and they didn't care anymore you know when you're really depressed you think nobody cares about you so they were just by them not responding to anything or showing support they were just validating that feeling that I wasn't worth anything. And then, so I don't think I was actually mean to anyone or I was a jerk. I was just really quiet and withdrawn. But it's interesting you say that in the 20s, they wouldn't have been aware. I mean, I've gone through this and I see people go through this now and I still struggle uh, to remind myself what it's like for them and help them. It's, it's, I still, yeah, even having the experience myself. So I think it is very hard for somebody on the outside to understand you can't understand what someone in this situation is going through. It's very hard to help. When, when you came, how long till you came out of it? Was it, you know, I think maybe you said six weeks, like things got lighter, they weren't as heavy and you just went back to yeah. normal life and didn't think about it or? Well, no, like so I think it was, it yeah, so I think there was six weeks before I even agreed to take the medication in the first place. So it was at least three months that I was in a really bad place and It took a long time. I remember I had to go, and this may be where the social anxiety started, but when you first re-enter society and you go back to start doing the things that you had done before. So I remember one of the very first things I had to do was go to a bar to meet up with some of my PhD friends. And I made one of them come outside to the street to meet me and go in with me. That was extremely difficult. I remember that feeling so well because I've had it again since then many times that yeah first time the first day I went back into the lab to work you know to do my work pick up my work again for my PhD the first time I went to a bar to a social situation the first time I saw anybody who I hadn't seen for those three months it was awful it was really really hard to think what have they been thinking or uh, how do I interact with people again how do I have a conversation I don't want to talk about what I've just been through. So what do I talk about? What if they ask something awkward? Can't think of questions to ask them. It was, everything was going through my brain. It was really, really hard to sort of come back after that. But, and I don't know how long it took before I started to feel more relaxed. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Since you do cancer research, I would think, I don't know if you're away from it because you're on the research side, but, you know, obviously people that have cancer, they deal with a lot of depression. You know, I know personally yeah. I had thyroid cancer and for a while it like, you know, melted my insides and when I heard, you know, what was going on. So I'm sure, you know, the people that I don't again, I don't know if you are close to these people, if you work with actual people that have cancer or if yeah. your research is more just lab based, but what's that been like? Has that do you feel like you have any better insights or tools into not just the 
mechanics of the disease, but again, how it affects people emotionally? Yeah, so I think, so my boss is a clinician, so I get a lot of the patient side of things from her. Um, We do directly help patients. So I am aware, you know, every week we discuss cases um, to work out what treatments we can find for them. So we get the background of, you know, how old they are, what, you know, what's if they have family and what their background story is. So I do sort of hear a lot about the patients and yeah, I just can't, I haven't experienced cancer personally. I've got, I've had family, but myself, I haven't had cancer. So I can't imagine what it is, what it feels like, but I can sort of understand the anxiety of, yeah, after treatment, you know, wondering if it's coming back that sort of anxiety that you would have and actually puts my anxieties, my social anxieties and my depression into, yeah, makes my stuff feel really small. So maybe that's why I don't seem to struggle so much with anxiety and depression as much anymore because I realise my stuff is, well, I think my stuff is small compared to what what you were just talking about with really big problems like having cancer. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, depression is very serious too. I'm not trying to minimise it at all, but... I just wondered if it gives you a, uh, you know, like a secret superpower in understanding the people that you work with that have it. Again, you're not just looking at it. Maybe I'm just speculating. Maybe you don't look at it only as a scientist, but you also look at more of the human side because you've been through depression. Just a guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely always think about the human side and I have, I have friends who have gone through cancer or are still going through cancer journey. And I do really wonder about that side. So you, know, you, they, you know, they have psychologists and I completely understand you would need to talk to someone about this every week, even three years after you're, you know, cancer free. I could imagine you would still, well, for me, I would still have moments of anxiety and I, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. I remember when, um, you know, when the doctors seemed to say that everything was looking good, I felt like literally when I, when I left her office, like I had gotten out of jail. It's literally how I felt. Yeah. And it must it be weird, something yeah. you think about constantly. It must be just, yeah, in the back of your mind all the time. And how do you go about your normal day without thinking about it and, yeah, putting it aside? Uh, yeah, it must, it must be very difficult. Well, you, you mentioned, um, so you were on meds for a while and then you were off for, you said, I think six years. And then you went back on. Like, can you describe what happened then? How come you went back on? Oh, that's a whole other drama in my life. I could go on to a different podcast about infertility. So yeah, so I um I went to London for eight years and I was life was amazing there. I joined a triathlon club, I made some really brilliant friends, I met my husband, just everything was fantastic. So I thought I'll just slowly start to come off these this medication. And actually one of the um side effects of antidepressants, if you try and stop it, or for me, if I try and stop it too quickly. I get incredibly dizzy and I've actually realized that if the dizziness is really bad, it's not, I'm not ready to come off. I have to sort of increase again. And this time I didn't feel the dizziness. I just, it was so easy to just to drop the dose. So you do have to drop it slowly over weeks and then eventually stop. Um, And I was completely fine and I had absolutely no issues for those six years, but then yeah, my husband and I were having trouble with um, trying to have a kid. And so we was okay for a couple of years. And then a friend of mine said, Holly, I think you need to, I th- yeah, I don't think you're very uh, dealing with this very well. I don't, I think this is causing you to be a little bit down and perhaps you need to go and talk to somebody again. So I went back to counseling and talked to a GP about taking some medication again. And I've been on it since. So we have had a child and I've still been on it right the way through. So we've been very lucky to have one. I know, like I said, any, I know this is very personal stuff. So at any time, if you'd rather not say, it's okay. It won't bother me at all. And I appreciate <laughs> yeah, doing this. No, stuff. I'm very open. I'm also very open with the infertility stuff because I realize that's something that's also not talked about enough and mm. people need, and it's it's so isolating when you're going through it. You really feel like you're the only one who's who understands and who, uh, yeah, I, it's awful when you don't have anyone to talk to. You'd, well, for me, I just wanted to talk to people. I wanted to find somebody who was experiencing the same thing. So if I can help, if I can put it out there that I've had that experience and people want to talk to me about it to help them, then I'm very open to that. So so when you were on the medication, I guess you said about six weeks later, you started to feel lighter and then you probably got to a point where you were okay. And then after you were on the medication, like when you look back, all of a sudden you're on the medication for like one, two, three, four years. How come you kept taking it? 
you're just like, oh, I just keep taking it and you didn't think about it and didn't worry? Or like, what did that turn into? Yes, I guess I was worried about, I guess I was worried about going, having that experience again if I dropped the medication. But like I said, when I got to a point, so maybe I had been on it for, I'm trying to think of the timing. I've probably only been on it for five years when I, four or five years when I went off it again when I was in London. So yeah, I thought that's a good enough time. I'm really stable now. I make sure, so I know other things that I need to do to keep a healthy mind, like I said, exercise before and meditation. And I do actually make sure I've got a counsellor or a psychologist because I moved around a little bit in the UK. And then each time I was in a new place, I would go to the GP and organise a counsellor, even if I was feeling okay, just to have somebody who knows me if I'm suddenly not feeling okay. And it, I don't go very often, but It is good to, and I don't have one at the moment, for instance, but when I was over there, because I was by myself initially for such a long time, I needed to talk to somebody and and just make sure that I'm healthy and that there's there I have a support network if I suddenly need one. So, yeah, I think I have a lot of things that I know I need to eat healthily and get enough sleep and all of that sort of stuff will help as well as the medication and then so I had all of that in the background. I had my support network. I thought, okay, now I'm okay to come off the medication. And I was, I was fine, like I said, for six years. So yeah, I hadn't really thought about it being a problem being on it for so long before that. I guess, yeah, it's just, you just took it every day and you went about your day and you didn't think about it for a long time, mm, right? Yeah. And now I haven't thought about coming off it again. I don't know. It's not, I don't think mm. that it's a bad thing for my health. So I know how these SSRI work SSRIs work and if that's something that's just you know chemically wrong in my brain that needs to be balanced properly then that's completely fine like having you know drugs for diabetes or something so yeah okay okay yeah I just didn't think about it again it had someone think about it after they've been on it for a while but I guess they don't think about it just like you know anyone that takes any other medication yeah yeah I guess there will be a time when I come off it again um, and see how I go and but I don't think it's bad that I'm on them as I'm not aware of any long-term health like problems by being on these so maybe I should look into that a little bit more (laughs) yeah I don't know yeah but um the the CBT portion how long did you do that for um just probably those a couple of years over this bad episode probably toward to the end towards the end of my PhD and then I haven't done any more since then but I have kept all of my booklets and all of my notes and I don't do it anymore but in the past when I was really struggling with the way I was thinking about things I would pull them out and remind myself what the healthy way of thinking is but but like I said yeah I don't really have the depressive side of things anymore it's more the social anxiety that I get sometimes when that's not really the same as what I had back then that I need the CB that I needed the CBT for. Although it may, it may help, I guess, if I get myself into a little state about things. Oh, but you but, did yeah. it for for how long did you do the CBT? And then when the second go around, when you went back on medication, did you do CBT again or not this time? No, because I thought there was something. It was I was feeling down for a reason, and so I thought I needed just something a little bit medically. It wasn't. I wasn't thinking negatively so yeah I had a counselor to discuss about my th- my thoughts about my struggle struggles with pregnancy and things but I didn't have yeah so I had a counselor to just discuss that but we didn't do CBT I just needed to talk to somebody gotcha. yeah so any other lasting lessons that you have from your times of struggle or is it like I mean it's okay if it is but is just life okay now and it's behind you and you know, you don't want to open up Pandora's box or like, like how do you feel about what you've, been, what you've been through? I, in a way it's crazy. I feel kind of l- lucky because I have all these skills. I feel like I know who I am. I really know what makes me tick and I have skills that I can impart on other people if they're struggling, I guess. I've learned a lot of skills um, and also for myself, if I feel I'm heading in a negative way again so yeah it's been there have been really tough times but I don't feel sad about it now I don't feel like oh poor me anymore I used to think poor me why 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 do I struggle so much with life why is life so hard for me Mm. and it's so easy for everyone else and I don't feel like that anymore 
I feel like I have enough of the tools I need to help myself if I start to feel yeah oh that's good bad again so yeah are you more sensitive to people you work with and people in your family and all that as to their mental states or you know do you feel like you're just like anyone else like no special extra attention to that or skill yeah that's what I was thinking before I I don't perhaps I can pick up on things when someone else is going through a similar thing perhaps I can I just hope that if people are aware that I've had troubles before, they know they could speak to me if they have similar troubles. Yeah, I don't think I'm particularly aware. I should, I mean, we're all so busy, which is just really, really silly. But yeah, I mm. might not be paying attention um, as much as, yeah, so I may not be extra aware, but I would, and I don't know how helpful I am, but I'm there if, yeah, if people need to ask questions well, since, yeah since all this virus you know stuff uh do you feel like you have any additional insights into how that's affecting people or you know, like have you observed it's really giving trouble to people you know and you know are you experiencing it differently because you have these insights yeah i i mean i've seen it affecting everybody nobody's not affected by this right that more anxiety i think i have seen pop up in people than anything else i haven't really seen anyone Oh, a couple of people have struggled with the staying at home, but I guess in my work environment, I'm in a lucky environment that they have a lot of support and they've they jumped onto everything immediately. I think they just, yeah, uh, found ways around to help people who were struggling with it. But I saw it, yeah, I saw how this has affected everybody and I'm not sure if I'm better equipped to deal with it or help those people. I just tried to be really understanding like everybody was trying to be I think that yeah, okay. this is a difficult time and trying to think of ways would, that would help if someone was really having a hard time yeah well very good any last words you want to add or do you think we've we've done a, a good coverage of the you know what was going on with you yeah we've done it we've done a pretty good coverage I guess the social anxiety side of things was what I sometimes struggle with now which is when you you I, I go out so it's hard enough to go out to a big Thing where you know maybe 20 people at a, an event or whatever which yeah I guess I haven't had to worry about it the last two years because we haven't been out to do these things but yeah going to a party has always been a real struggle for me because I get somewhere I, I find it hard to initially get somewhere like I need to go straight away to the toilet or straight away to the bar or somewhere so I don't have to go up to people to say hi and then once I've relaxed and and talked to people I come home again and spend and this is when I'm in a bad place we'll spend the whole night thinking about what I've said or what they've said or what Mm. they must be thinking now and so in the end I wouldn't end up going out anymore because I didn't want to go through all of those things so that's sort of like that's what's sort of happened to me now not that doesn't happen all the time but if I ever have sort of a negative episode I call it then that's it's more about the social anxiety side of things rather than the depression side of things and yeah don't okay. yeah that's sort of extra difficulties that I, I think other people can also have in their lives and I have spoken to counsellors about this and there have been a couple of suggestions made how to get through these things but I still think that's a work in progress for me mm. yeah yeah okay well very good well Holly thank you so much for coming and being open you know I- I mean, you're doing this, and this is a pretty tough thing to do. So thank you for doing it. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Good to chat about it. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.